students. An additional twist is that all of the constructions in English are used not only literally, but in a, a quasi-metaphorical way. For example, this construction, the dative, is used not only to transfer things, but also for the metaphorical transfer of ideas, as when we say, she told a story to me or told me a story, Max taught Spanish to the students or taught the students Spanish. Exactly the same construction, but no muffins, no mice, nothing moving at all. Uh, it invokes the container metaphor of communication, in which we conceive of ideas as objects, sentences as containers, and communication as a kind of sending, as when we say we gather our ideas to put them into words, and if our words aren't empty or hollow, we might get these ideas across to a listener who can unpack our words to extract their content. And indeed, this kind of verbiage is not the exception, but the rule. It's very hard to find any example of abstract language that is not based on some concrete metaphor. For example, you can use the verb uh, go in the prepositions to and from in a s literal spatial sense. The messenger went from Paris to Istanbul. You can also say Biff went from sick to well. Uh, he needn't go anywhere. He could have been in bed the whole time, but it's as if his health is a point in state space that you conceptualize as moving. Or the meeting went from three to four, in which we conceive of time as stretched along a line. Likewise, we use force to indicate uh, not only physical force, as in Rose forced the door to open, but also interpersonal force, as in Rose forced Sadie to go, not necessarily by manhandling her, but by uh, issuing a threat. Or Rose forced herself to go, as if there were two entities inside Rose's head engaged in a tug of war. Second conclusion is that the ability to conceive of a given event in two different ways, such as cause something to go to someone and cause, causing someone to have something, I think is a fundamental uh, feature of human thought, and it's the basis for much human argumentation in which people don't differ so much on the facts as on how they ought to be construed. Just to give you a few examples, ending a pregnancy versus killing a fetus, a ball of cells versus an unborn child, invading Iraq versus liberating Iraq, redistributing wealth versus confiscating earnings. And I think the biggest picture of all would um, pay, take seriously the fact that so much of our uh, verbiage about abstract events is based on a concrete metaphor and see human intelligence itself as consisting of a, a repertoire of concepts such as object, space, time, causation, and intention, which are useful in a social, knowledge-intensive species whose evolution you can well uh, imagine, and a process of metaphorical abstraction that allows us to bleach these concepts of their original conceptual content, uh, space, uh, time and force, and apply them to new abstract domains, therefore allowing a species that evolved to deal with rocks and tools and animals to conceptualize mathematics, physics, law, and uh, other abstract domains. Well, I said I'd talk about two windows on human nature, the cognitive machinery with which we conceptualize the world. Now I'm going to say a few words about the relationship types that govern human social interaction, again, as reflected in language. And I'll start out with a puzzle, the puzzle of indirect speech acts. Now, I'm sure most of you have seen the movie Fargo. You might remember the scene in which the kidnapper is pulled over by a police officer, is asked to show his driver's license, and holds his wallet out with a $50 bill uh, extending at a slight angle out of the wallet. And he says, I was just thinking that maybe we could take care of it here in Fargo, which uh, everyone, including the audience, interprets uh, as a veiled bribe. And this kind of indirect speech is rampant in language. For example, uh, you, in polite requests, if someone says, if you could pass the guacamole, that would be awesome. We know exactly what it, <laughs> he means, even though that that's a rather bizarre uh, uh, concept being expressed. <laughs> <clears throat> would you like to come up and see my etchings? I think most people uh, uh, understand the intent behind that. And uh, likewise, uh, if someone says, nice story you got there, it would be a real shame if something happened to it. <laughs> we understand that as a veiled threat rather than as a musing of hypothetical possibilities. So the puzzle is, why are bribes, polite requests, solicitations, and threats so often veiled when both, no one's fooled, both parties know exactly what the speaker means, and the speaker knows that the listener knows that the speaker knows that the listener knows, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what's going on? I think the key idea is that language is uh, a way of negotiating relationships. And human relationships fall into a number of types. There's an influential taxonomy by the anthropologist Alan Fisk, which 
relationships can be categorized more or less into communality, which works on the principle what's mine is thine, what's thine is mine, the kind of uh, mindset that operates within a family, for example. Dominance, whose principle is don't mess with me. Uh, and reciprocity, uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And sexuality, in the immortal words of uh, Cole Porter, let's do it. Now, relationships types can be negotiated, even though there are default situations in which one of these mindsets can be applied, they can be stretched and uh, extended. For example, communality applies most naturally within family or friends, but it can be used to try to transfer the uh, mentality of sharing to groups that ordinarily would not be disposed to exercise it. For example, in brotherhoods, fraternal organizations, uh, sororities, locutions like the family of men, you try to get people who are not related to use the uh, relationship type that would ordinarily be appropriate to uh, close kin. Now, mismatches, when one person assumes one relationship type and another assumes a, a different one, can be awkward. If you went over and you helped yourself to a shrimp off your boss's plate, for example, that would be an awkward situation. Or if a dinner guest, after the meal, pulled out his wallet and offered to pay you for the meal, that would be rather uh, awkward as well. In uh, less uh, blatant cases, there's still a kind of negotiation that often goes on. Uh, in the workplace, for example, there's often a tension over whether an employee can socialize with a boss or, or uh, refer to him or her by a, on a first-name basis. If two friends have a, a reciprocal transaction, like selling a car, it's well known that this can be a source of tension or awkwardness. In dating, the transition from uh, friendship to sex can lead to, notoriously to various forms of awkwardness, and as can sex in the workplace, in which we call the conflict between dominance, uh, a dominant and a sexual relationship sexual harassment. Well, what does this have to do with language? Well, language, as a social interaction, has to satisfy two conditions. You have to convey the actual content. Here we get back to the container metaphor. You want to express the bribe, the command, the promise, the uh, solicitation, and so on. But you also have to negotiate and maintain the kind of relationship you have with the other person. And the solution, I think, is that we use language at two levels. The literal form signals the safest relationship with the listener, whereas the implicated content, the reading between the lines that we count on the listener to perform, uh, allows the listener to derive the interpretation which is most relevant in context, which possibly initiates a changed relationship. The simplest example of this is in the polite request. Uh, if you express your request as a conditional, uh, if you could open the window, that would be great. The, even though the content is an imperative, the fact that you're not using the imperative voice means that you're not uh, acting as if you're in a relationship of dominance where you could presuppose the compliance of the other person. On the other hand, you want the damn guacamole. By expressing it as an if-then statement, you can get the message across without uh, appearing to boss another person around. And in a more subtle way, I think this works for all of the uh, veiled speech acts involving plausible deniability, the bribes, threats, propositions, solicitations, and so on. One way of thinking about it is to imagine what it would be like if language were, could only be used literally. And you can think of it in terms of a, um, a game theoretic payoff matrix. Uh, put yourself in the position of the uh, kidnapper wanting to bribe the officer. There's a, a uh, high stakes in uh, the two possibilities of having a dishonest officer or an honest officer. If you don't bribe the officer, then you will get a traffic ticket, or as in the case of uh, Fargo, uh, worse, whether the honest officer is honest or dishonest, nothing, nothing ventured, nothing gained. In that case, the consequences are rather uh, severe. On the other hand, if you extend the bribe, if the officer is dishonest, you get a huge payoff of going free. If the officer is honest, you get a huge penalty of being arrested for bribery. So this is a rather fraught situation. On the other hand, with indirect language, if you issue a veiled bribe, then the dishonest officer could interpret it as a bribe, in which case you get the payoff of going free. The honest officer can't 
uh, hold you to it as being a bribe, and therefore you get the nuisance of the uh, traffic tickets. You get the best of uh, both worlds. And a similar analysis, I think, can apply to the potential awkwardness of a sexual solicitation uh, and other cases where plausible deniability is an asset. I think this affirms something that's long been known by uh, diplomats, namely that the vagueness of language, far from being a uh, bug or an imperfection, actually might be a feature of language, one that we use to our advantage in social interactions. So to sum up, uh, language is a collective human creation reflecting human nature, how we conceptualize reality, how we relate to one another, and that by uh, analyzing the various quirks and complexities of language, I think we can get a uh, window onto what makes us tick. Thank you very much.